might see in either palliative care or hospice uh, with pediatrics. Actually, I could do four of these lectures, uh, you know, to take the top 20 diagnoses or so. But um, other than to mention them in passing, um, it's difficult to, to do a, a reasonable job of, um, of that broad, such broad topic. So cystic fibrosis, we're, we've not been a cystic fibrosis center here, but there are, there have been two of them in the city for a long time. St. Vincent's was one of them, and I understand that they've brought a lot of their cystic fibrosis patients here now. Uh, Lich was the other one, so I actually got to see quite a lot of these patients through the years. It's a hereditary disorder um, characterized by lung congestion, infection, and malabsorption. Uh, of the, by the pancreas, and I'm just going to go th through some of the physiology. It's the most common fatal autosomal recessive disease in Caucasian folks, and the frequency is 1 in 2,000 to 3,000 live births. And <clears throat> what we see is persistent pulmonary infection, pancreatic insufficiency, elevated sweat chloride is the hallmark of diagnosis. Okay. And many patients demonstrate mild or atypical symptoms. So um, for those of you who remember Mendelian inheritance, you have a mother and father, each who are a carrier, uh, so that 25%, uh, there's 25% chance that the offspring will have the disease. <clears throat> you have to have two copies of the recessive gene in order to show the disease. Um, it's a single large gene on chromosome 7 that um, causes the mutation. And what's mutated is a protein called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. And what that does is regulate chloride and sodium, uh, but mainly chloride, uh, through the cell membrane. And clinical disease requires disease-causing mutations in both copies. Everybody has two copies of every gene, one from mother, one from father, and you need two copies in order to have the disease. And there's an uh, artist's conception of the protein, and it's, you can see the chloride is going through. Um, and that's what it regulates. Um, and on the sign there, there's the, what causes it in the most common uh, <clears throat> mutation, which is Delta 508, is a site of, uh, of phenylalanine deletion. And that's what causes this horrible disease. Um, you have to have clinical symptoms consistent with cystic fibrosis in at least one organ system and evidence of dysfunction of this protein in order to say this is cystic fibrosis. And the sweat chloride um, has to be elevated. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, the sweat chloride test. Um, you take the baby and uh, put a little pilocarpine um, and uh, some electrodes to make them sweat. You collect the sweat on a piece of paper, and then you measure the salt content. Um, the other thing they can do is nasal impedance. Uh, this is, uh, they put some electrodes in and see what the impedance through the nose is. Because of the very thick mucus you get in cystic fibrosis, it's um, increased. Um, so a patient's going to have clinical disease in one or more organ systems and have an elevated sweat chloride. Um, most patients have disease manifestations in multiple organ systems. Um, there's non-classic CF uh, in which the clinical picture looks like cystic fibrosis, but there's a normal or intermediate sweat chloride, in which case you have to go to DNA analysis. For example, there are patients who have isolated azoospermia or chronic pancreatitis that are sort of a cystic fibrosis uh, variant without classical, um, meeting classical criteria. Whoops. Um, so there's an abnormal transport of chloride and sodium across the respiratory uh, epithelium, which results in this very thick mucus and airway secretions. And in a period of months to decades, you get chronic respiratory infection, progressive respiratory insufficiency, and finally respiratory failure. And most um, patients who die from cystic fibrosis die from respiratory failure. Um, People who have the same types of genes don't always have the same types of expression or disease. So we say that's because there's gene modifiers. And there are two particular genes that might exacerbate pulmonary disease, one that suppresses T cell activation and the other that's related to the complement system and puts patients at risk, higher risk for pyogenic um, infections. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Um, you can take a look at these slides if you want. So the 
there's progressive uh, colonization of the pulmonary system with pathogenic bacteria like H. influenzae, staph, uh, Pseudomonas in particular, or Burkholderia cepatia complex. I think that uh, patient that I had the other day who uh, was a leukemic who got Guillain-Barre actually had infection with cepatia, B. cepatia, um, which they think led to the Guillain-Barre. Um, so the chronic lung disease, you get infiltration of inflammatory cells into the lungs. The neutrophils release something called elastase. Uh, which overwhelms the antiproteases of the lungs and results in tissue destruction. Um, so the DNA and cytosol matrix proteins are released uh, by the neutrophils, and so you get increased viscosity um, in the mucus, um, so resulting ultimately in tissue injury um, and infection. And, uh, so this abnormally decreased oxygen tension in the mucus layer um, in the respiratory epithelium, this local hypoxia induces changes in the bacteria in the pseudomonas, and it results in the development of these big colonies of bacteria called macro colonies. They're impossible to eradicate, and that's why this infection is so um, uh, difficult. And that's the bacteria, that's a pseudomonas. Um, this is a, a schematic of um, the first um, diagram there, uh, number A, is the normal uh, respiratory epithelium. And then the CF, um, you can see that the, um, the mucus layer um, is much thicker. That's the green stuff, and eventually it's taken over by bacteria. Um, <clears throat> the thickened secretions also causes gastrointestinal complications. You have impaired bile flow, malabsorption mal and maldigestion, uh, progressive liver and pancreatic disease, CF-related diabetes, and um, CF patients are prone to intestinal obstruction and rectal prolapse. Um, there's other diseases also related to the abnormality in this protein, um, chronic sinusitis, um, bronchiectasis, chronic pancreatitis, and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to skip this one. Um, cystic fibrosis uh, clinical picture is that of a persistent productive cough. You get hyperinflation of the lungs on chest x-ray, and uh, the pulmonary function test shows obstructive airway disease. You can get chronic bronchitis with, uh, with or without bronchiectasis, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, so when these patients get acute exacerbations of the disease, they get increased cough, rapid respiratory rate, shortness of breath, increased phlegm production, and malaise, anorexia, weight loss, and finally clubbing of the fingers. Um, so the chest x-ray will show a very hyperinflated uh, picture because it's obstructive airway disease. Um, so the lungs aren't supposed to uh, look this black. And then on a CAT scan, uh, you can show these areas of collapse called atelectasis um, and the uh, bronchiectasis, which is uh, widening um, and collapse of the airways. And that's on post. Um, you can see the, the airways are very dilated and large uh, from the tissue destruction. Um, <clears throat> most uh, patients with cystic fibrosis have uh, opacification of all of the nasal sinuses, uh, can have nasal polyposis in a certain percentage, and also have chronic sinusitis. Um, the pancreatic disease, most patients have some degree of pancreatic insufficiency from birth. Um, there's insufficient secretion of digestive enzymes, malabsorption of fat. This results in failure to thrive. Uh, we talk about adult failure to thrive being weight loss. Well, the original failure to thrive was seen in pediatrics, which is failure to gain weight, because uh, children are supposed to gain weight. So that's what real failure to thrive is. Um, less commonly, you can get edema, electrolyte loss, hyperproteinemia, um, and this is mostly reversible if you give oral pancreatic enzyme extracts, um, but can still result in acute or chronic pancreatitis and uh, CF-related diabetes. Um, the hallmark of what's pathognomonic of uh, this disease in infancy is something called meconium ileus. Uh, meconium is the first stool passed by infants. And uh, when one gets an obstruction, a bowel obstruction in relation to this, um, and distal ileobstruction, it's called meconium ileus. Uh, 
In adults, there's an equivalent called DOS, uh, distal intestinal obstructive syndrome. Um, and about 15% of adult patients with cystic fibrosis may, may show it. And it's called a meconium ileus equivalent in an adult. It can be controlled medically, occasionally surgery. Um, uh, there needs to be surgical intervention. Um, so this is a, a picture of a baby, um, probably a newborn, uh, with these widely dilated loops of bowel um, uh, that you can see this is an obstructive pattern. Um, the biliary disease, uh, patients can get uh, cirrhosis due to the thick uh, bile secretion, uh, elevations of liver enzymes, uh, enlarged liver, uh, or can be asymptomatic. They can have as asymptomatic liver disease. And progressively, they'll get cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and bleeding from varices in the esophagus. Uh, it's the third leading cause for liver transplantation in late childhood. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, a lot of uh, males with CF are infertile due to defects in sperm transport. Um, sperm production is not affected, but there's incompletely developed uh, Wolfian structures. Those are the embryologic structures that give rise to the reproductive tract and absent vas deferens. Um, and what it shows is that this gene that's mutated in CF is critical in organ formation in, in early embryology. Um, you can occasionally treat it uh, microsurgically. <clears throat> and um, I won't go into that. There's a certain smaller, smaller percentage of women are infertile um, due, due to an abnormally tenacious cervical mucus. If um, the expiratory volume, um, the forced expiratory volume on pulmonary function test is more than 50 or 60 percent of a predicted value in a woman who's pregnant, the uh, maternal fetal outcome is favorable. So it's really dependent on the lung disease, the amount of lung disease. <clears throat> um, patients with CF have reduced bone mineral content, reduced bone den density, accelerated rates of bone loss, and uh, certain arthropathies that are associated with it. It's hypertrophic osteoarthropathy that's um, thickening um, of the bones, uh, the distal uh, portions of the bones. There's uh, cystic fibrosis-associated arthropathy. And finally, there's clubbing of the fingers from the chronic hypoxia. And um, it's uh, similar mechanisms that give rise to both. So here you can see finger bones. <clears throat> the bones of the hand, um, if you look, they're white lines uh, in each bone at the um, proximal and distal end of each bone. And that's not supposed to be there. Um, so that's uh, the bones are getting um, uh, overly uh, deposited with calcium. Um, clubbing of the fingers. Uh, I remember we had an intern when I was in residency who had cystic fibrosis. And she had the most remarkable clubbing of the fingers. And it was really the only way you could tell that uh, she, was, uh, she wasn't a normal um, uh, person. But, uh, and uh, so this can be quite pronounced. And you can see the normal angle of the nail. And in clubbing, um, it sort of gets rounded in that. And when it really gets impressive, it, it's very difficult to miss. Um, <clears throat> cystic fibrosis patients are at risk for venous thrombosis. Um, and um, some of those patients, uh, a great, great number of those patients who uh, experienced uh, thrombosis in childhood were colonized with this um, bacteria, uh, B. cephatia. Treatment is antibiotics and bronchodilators during these episodes, um, agents to promote airway secretion clearance, hypertonic saline, um, mucormist, and acetylcysteine. Uh, chest physiotherapy, uh, the anti macrolide antibiotics seem to have an anti-inflammatory uh, effect, uh, as well as ibuprofen or glucocorticoids. Um, immunization is, is very, uh, very important. Um, palavizumab is an uh, um, immunization against RSV, and that's really important uh, to, um, to do. And finally, lung transplantation, if all else fails, is being um, well, I don't think it's um, all that common right now. <clears throat> a lot of investigational therapies. If you look on the internet for um, CF, you'll see all, all sorts of new agents that are being tried. Um, and I won't go into that right now, but you can look at it if you feel so obliged. Um, 
talk a little bit about sickle cell disease, which is another very common chronic illness in children and adolescents. The hallmark is vaso-occlusive phenomenon, um, these episodes where the veins get occluded due to the sickling and pumping of the red blood cells, um, uh, causing a lot of pain to the target organs. Um, uh, you can get hemolytic crisis. Um, it's an inherited uh, disorder. Um, again, you have to have homozygosity for the uh, abnormal hemoglobin or two copies of the genes. People get recurrent painful episodes. Um, and uh, serious organ system complications after years of having sickle uh, disease. And most of these patients have uh, long li lifelong disabilities and or early death, um, although that, that is getting better. Um, the overall survival is reduced, but it is steadily improving. Um, comprehensive care, immunizations, antibiotics, hydroxyurea therapy, and more rapid treatment of complications contributes to this uh, increase in survival. And so it's kind of shifted from what used to be a very fatal pediatric illness to more of a chronic disease. Um, but there still is progressive deterioration in quality of life and certainly in organ function. Um, th this is a, one slide does all about the consequences of sickle cell disease. Um, it's caused by a change of one base pair in a DNA molecule, which gives rise to an abnormal hemoglobin, you get sickling of red cells, um, uh, and you get anemia, which causes enlarged heart, slow development, impaired mental function, weakness, um, proliferation of the bone marrow, which causes changes in the bones, um, impaired blood supply to the various organs can, can um, cause damage to the heart muscle with heart failure, uh, lung damage, muscles and joints giving rise to rheumatic conditions. Uh, brain damage and strokes, um, abdominal organ damage causing abdominal pain, and finally kidney failure. Um, <clears throat> because the sickle cells concentrate um, in the spleen, you get enlargement of the spleen uh, and basically becomes non-functional by age two or so. And then you get fibrosis finally. <clears throat> so this is a disease with lots of organ system involvement. Um, <clears throat> the CDC looked at uh, trends in pediatric sickle cell disease-related mortality from 1983 to, to 2002 and found that there was actually a 68% reduction through those years in mortality in the very young children aged 0 to 3, 39% uh, decline in the older patients. But in patients over 10 years, there really wasn't such a significant reduction um, in mortality in older children. Um, and the reason for that may be varied. Um, the reasons for the decreased mortality in these young children is attributed to immunization, pneumococcal vaccine, the, the <coughs> rather um, multivalent um, pneumococcal vaccine, a um, vaccine developed uh, because this is what these patients are so susceptible to is pneumococcus. Um, so who are the er infants and children? who will be at the high, highest risk for complications in later life. There was a cooperative study of sickle cell disease uh, that looked at 392 infants. They followed them for 10 years, and the results of various um, findings were looked at um, <clears throat> when the pa before the age of two. Uh, so they looked back at these patients and saw what findings they had before they were two to see if they could predict um, who would be at risk for what. And so what predicted adverse outcome later in life? And um, I forgot what that 18% mean. I have to look at that. Um, dactylitis is a swelling of the hands um, due to uh, bone, um, bone infiltration, bone swelling. Before the age of one um, was one of the things that predicted um, an adverse outcome. Um, hemoglobin concentration less than seven. This is before age two and leukocytosis in the absence of infection. I always remember we'd see these sickle patients uh, that would come in and clinically didn't look like they had an infection, but would have these uh, monumental white counts. And um, I always thought it was rather usual for sickle disease in the population I used to deal with. But uh, actually, if you have these things in a, in a baby, um, it predicts, uh, I think there's 18% chance that this patient will have a significant outcome, meaning um, a stroke, 
or some sort of major thrombotic event or early, <clears throat> very early mortality. Um, <coughs> the disease is characterized by acute painful episodes. Uh, in terms of neurologic injury, 24% of patients with sickle disease have an overt stroke before they're 45. 25% of children have silent ischemic lesions. In multi-organ failure, um, psychological issues, um, growth failure, delayed puberty, infections, uh, cerebrovascular events, and bone complications. Um, the risk factors for infarctive stroke um, include a prior transient ischemic attack, a low steady state hemoglobin, rate of acute chest syndrome, which is one of the real predictors. Um, episode of acute chest syndrome within the previous two weeks, that's two episodes of acute chest syndrome two weeks apart, and uh, elevated systolic blood pressure. So those are the things you need uh, to look at um, in terms of predicting um, the relative risk of stroke. Um, other manifestations include bone complications, cardiac complications, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, uh, dermatologic complications, hepatobiliary, fetal maternal complications. We know that that's a very high-risk pregnancy, uh, acute chest symptoms, and even retinopathy. Okay. So I'm not going to go into any treatment of that. That's uh, different. Next thing I want to look at, and um, certainly a lot of the patients we see in palliative are uh, cerebral palsy patients. Um, it, this is a really heterogeneous group of clinical syndromes. And it's due to abnormalities of the developing brain. It's characterized by motor abnormalities and postural dysfunction. And occurs in anywhere from two to four cases per 1,000 children born. The risk factor is low birth weight, of which we see many more uh, low birth weight infants who survive now. And the etiology is really multifactorial. <coughs> the prenatal risk factors, um, prematurity, uh, intrauterine growth retardation, that's a, a very small baby, uh, small for gestational age. Intrauterine infection, antepartum hemorrhage, severe placental pathology, multiple pregnancies. Perinatal hypoxia or ischemia likely accounts for only a relatively small minority of cases of CP. And classically, a lot of people think that's the cause of it, a birth, a birth hypoxia, and it's really not. Um, <clears throat> if a patient who has a stroke in the perinatal period often results in spastic hemiparesis, thromboembolism and prothrombotic disorders contribute to the etiology. Um, and it develops in somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of surviving very low birth weight infants. That's an infant that's less than 1,500 grams at birth. Okay, three pounds, more or less. Um, uh, they get hemorrhages around the brain, they get periventricular leukomalacia, that's the softening of the area of the brain around the ventricles. Um, it's been found that uh, um, antenatal administration of uh, magnesium sulfate in preterm labor decreases the incidence and severity. Glad I got it. Um, this is, uh, um, uh, prem premature babies are very susceptible to neonatal hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage. And the smaller they are, the higher risk they are. <clears throat> so here you can see the uh, ventricles are the black areas in there. And the white areas that are not supposed to be there is the blood that's, uh, that's gone into the, into the ventricle. And it it's, uh, has four grades, uh, four being the worst. Um, what happens also is that the uh, brain ventricles will get um, softening uh, and this thing called leukomalacia. And that's uh, very characteristic. Um, so we have an abnormal motor activity and posture. Movements, instead of being fluid and coordinated or uncoordinated, stereotypic and very limited. Um, simple actions sometimes, if you watch a patient with CP, can be, require really marked effort, um, just simply reaching for something. Um, severely affected individuals um, and attempted voluntary movement evokes a primitive reflex or contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles at the same time um, and, it's, uh, and mass movements. Classification is based upon the type and distribution of motor abnormalities and there's a substantial overlap among the different types. <clears throat> Spastic, dyskinetic, and ataxic are the main uh, descriptors um, they use. <clears throat> 
spastic cerebral palsy is an upper motor neuron syndrome. And what you see is spastic hypertonia, hyperreflexia, extensor plantar responses, and clonus. Okay. Do you remember our patient yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah he had clonus. Um, so um, they're slow and effortful, effortful voluntary movements, impaired fine motor function, difficulty in isolating individual movements, and easy fatig fatigability of the muscles. Um, and, you know, again, location-wise, <coughs> it can occur in both legs, in one arm, one leg, in all four um, extremities. Um, and this is just another um, example of the location uh, that it can be. So it can be in all these different locations, and it's classified um, uh, differently. Um, dyskinetic uh, CP affects term infants. Um, this results from severe acute perinatal asphyxia. Um, neonatal, in the neonatal period, um, it presents as an encephalopathy with lethargy, decreased spontaneous movement, hypotonia, suppressed primitive reflexes, with a later development of athetosis, chorea, and dystonia. Ataxic CB, CP is where there's ataxic movements and speech. Um, it's usually associated with widespread motor dysfunction. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, other causes of weakness, spasticity, dystonia, choreoathetosis needs to be ruled out, um, and um, including other, other neurodegenerative disorders that include ataxia as part of it. And this is just an example of um, where some chorea and athetosis uh, usually um, originates in the brain. Um, another to uh, form of CB that they talk about is atonic syndromes. Um, it describes infants with very severe hypotonia, very decreased tone, uh, often microcephalic, um, with profound intellectual disabilities and developmental delay. And so here's a summary of all the different types of cerebral palsy. Uh, it can be hemiplegic, diplegic, uh, involving, or quadriplegic, involving all of the limbs. Um, it can be athetoid, uh, which describes the types of movements, uh, dystonic, which means there's um, relative abnormality of tone, and finally ataxia, which is, um, um, may be more located in, cere in cerebellar area. Um, there may be severe intellectual disability with some of these children, learning disabilities, behavioral, emotional disorders, seizures, and impaired vision, and speech. Talk about epilepsy and cerebral palsy because it occurs in about 45% of patients. Uh, most common in patients with spastic quadriplegia and acquired hemiplegia. Less common in the milder forms uh, of spastic diplegia or athetoid CP. Usually onset within the first two years of life. Uh, partial seizures with secondary generalization are the most common type. That is, the seizure starts in one place and then generalizes to become uh, a, a generalized or grand mal type seizure. Um, infantile spasms <coughs> are, occur in some infants, um, particularly those with microcephaly and spastic quad quadriplegic or atonic CP. Um, you may see aphasia or dysarthria, uh, which occurs in about 38% overall of children with CP. And that's due to an abnormal function of the oropharyngeal muscles, a lack of coordination of breathing patterns, as well as hearing impairment or intellectual disabilities. Um, poor nutritional status is due to inadequate intake, gastrointestinal abnormalities. Um, more than 90% of patients with CP have very significant GI symptoms. They have swallowing disorders, chronic constipation, regurgitation or vomiting, chronic aspiration and chronic abdominal pain, and some series up to 75% of patients. Secondary consequences are orthopedic problems, um, joint subluxation, dislocations, hip dysplasias, osteopenia, and urinary disorders. This is, um, illustrates, uh, is a good illustration of a child with CP who's got one hip that's subluxed. You can see on one side the hip joint on the, our left side there, the hip joint fits very nicely into the socket. It's a ball and socket joint. And on the, the other side, it's pulled out. And what happens is the muscle imbalance pulls the hip out of the socket. So um, 
uh, orthopedics, orthopedists do very well with these children because they have to be put in sometimes uh, surgically. Um, so that's a, um, uh, the uh, femoral um, derotational osteotomies uh, that they do. It's for this. Um, once the hip comes out of the socket, the hip joint starts to deform. So if it's normally nice and curved like this, it starts to straighten out. So if it's a child who walks, and most of these children have very severe hip dislocations, don't walk. Um, but um, if they do, it's important to do that in a timely fashion. Um, chronic pulmonary disease is the single leading cause of death among patients with severe CP. And that's due to recurrent aspiration, due to, G due to reflux, and uh, incoordination of the palate and pharyngeal muscles. And restrictive disease due to scoliosis. Muscle imbalance causes scoliosis. And if scoliosis gets very severe, it compromises the hearts and heart and lungs in the thoracic area. <clears throat> um, gastros gastrostomy feeds do reduce aspiration during feeding, but it doesn't address the aspiration of oral secretions. So um, it may also they may, it may also exacerbate gastroesophageal reflux because you're putting more food in the stomach, so there's more there to reflux. Um, most, most kids with CP survive to adulthood. 20-year uh, survival ranged from 80, 87 to 94 um, percent. Survival is related to the severity of the impairment, the birth weight, and socioeconomic status, uh, the, with the number of severe impairments having the greatest effect um, on prognosis. Um, the survival into adulthood de depends, again, upon the degree of disability. Um, over 15 years in California, they looked at uh, life expectancies and predictors of mortality in almost 25,000 patients uh, greater than 15 years of age with CP. The survival in high-functioning adults was similar to the general population. However, life expectancy is substantially reduced in those who lacked mobility and feeding. Okay. So. Um, and it was as short as 11 years in some of the most severely affected patients. Whether or not a child will, with CP will walk is probably the biggest, biggest question on a parent's mind uh, once the diagnosis is made, uh, if there's delayed walking. <clears throat> the prognosis for motor function depends upon the type of CP, <clears throat> whether there's developmental reflexes or abnormal reflexes present child's intellectual ability, if there are any sensory impairments along with it, emotional social adjustment, um, significant intellectual impairment often accompanies severe motor deficits. Um, and patients with CP who walk before the age of two years typically have normal or borderline normal IQ. Prognosis for walking is good in children who can sit by the age of two years and crawl before the age of 30 months. Okay. Children who walk independently usually do so by the time they're three years of age. And children who will need to walk with support may take up to nine years to do that. But someone who doesn't walk by age nine years is unlikely to do so. Um, so sometimes you have these parents with older children really, really hoping that eventually they'll get to walking. But I think nine years is sort of the cutoff. If somebody is unable to do it with or without support by nine years, they probably will not walk. Therapy of spasticity um, and hyperreflexia, um, these interfere with function, lead to contractures of the muscles. There's, some, there's stronger evidence overall to support the use of botulinum toxin rather than an oral anti-spasticity um, drugs like baclofen and dantrolene. Uh, surgical procedures can be helpful in severely affected non ambulatory patients with contractures. Um, we were putting in baclofen pumps, again, they're um, Intrathecal administration of baclofen is probably most helpful in this category, non-ambulatory non patients with contractures. It probably provides the most benefit for those patients. Um, and this is a study um, on the efficacy of Botox in cerebral palsy. Uh, so we used to, for a while we were doing selective dorsal rhizotomies that we were cutting nerves um, in the spinal cord that decreased the tone and the spasticity. And what they ended up with initially was a lot of floppy kids. 
and they sort of overdid it when this procedure first came out about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but um, it may, if, if you define your population correctly, um, it may have a, a beneficial effect. And that's just a picture of that. Orthopedic interventions, disorders of the hip, very common in CP. Uh, I showed you that before. Um, recommend regular radiographic screening of these children. Um, and early detection and surgical treatment improves the outcome overall. Uh, physical therapy has been an established part of treatment of CP for time immemorial. Um, the imp interventions attempt to reduce muscle tone. Okay? Clinical studies have never <laughs> established its effectiveness. Um, whether that's because we haven't done the right studies or looked at it the right way, but it's, it's always been, you know, these huge physical therapy departments always accompany orthopedic, uh, <laughs> you know, and there's never, there's really no literature that's supported. Um, so because the incidence of contractures, that is fixed muscle deformity, uh, need for bracing, and orthopedic surgeries are exactly the same in patients who get physical therapy as just those who don't, so. But um, we, we do it just the same. One of the things my patients with CP always complained about was drooling. This is a major, major complaint. It's, it's, it's socially restrictive, um, and the oral motor dysfunction is what leads to it. Sometimes it improves as the kids get older. Um, we would treat them with some anticholinergic agents, atropine, um, scopolamine, glycopyrrolate. Do you know they make a flavored liquid formulation of glycopyrrolate? Um, and the name of them is Coposa, in case you want. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get some and taste it. I don't know. I don't know what flavor it is. Uh, some people for a while were injecting the submandibular region with Botox. Uh, I had one patient who had her salivary glands removed because it, it was such a problem for her, a uh, teenager. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go. Before you leave that, mm -hmm. Um, earlier you talked about the secretions, the mm -hmm. problem with secretions. Mm -hmm. Is drooling and secretions related, and do any of these interventions help secretions so the risk of aspiration is less, this, this group of interventions? Well, I think the secretions and the drooling are both related to the oral motor, oropharyngeal oral muscle, muscle dysfunction. Okay, they can't process secretions like a normal person does. Uh -huh. um, as far as the secretions, again, they do... Um, um, gastrostomy uh, feedings, um, just so that it doesn't wind, wind up in the lungs. And, uh, but, n hi Deb, I'm giving a lecture, I'll call you back. I did, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, what were we, were we talking about the, yeah. Um, you know, I don't think it's as much of a secretion problem as it is, say, in cystic fibrosis. Do they treat um, secretions in the chest with uh, anticholinergic agents? You can, if it's really excessive. Um, but um, you can't fix the, the motor dysfunction is what the problem is, which is the primary problem. All right, I'm just going to do one more topic, and that's um, long-term complications of prematurity. Um, here we see a typical NICU uh, patient. Okay, and just, just about uh, everything's monitored and um, done artificially for this patient. He's intubated, he's artificially fed. Um, he may or may not be under phototherapy there for jaundice, I don't know. Um, they did a study years ago that found that this intense light that they have in neonatal units is, is very detrimental. So they started putting, um, you know, shades on these babies and... Uh, I, I, would, I had hoped they were going to turn down the lights, but, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, complications of prematurity is the reason for the higher rate of mortality, infant mortality, and morbidity in preterm infants compared to full term. The risk of complications increases with increasing immaturity, and extremely premature infants at or before 25 weeks of gestation have the highest mortality rate, which is about 50%. And if they survive, are at the greatest risk for long-term morbidity. Um, the major cause of morbidity is long-term neurodevelopmental disabilities. In addition, these patients have chronic medical problems, respiratory abnormalities, poor growth, and frequent hospitalizations, uh, certainly in the first three years of life. 
Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, each of that, including the effect that prematurity has on being an adult, your health as being an adult. Uh, premature uh, survivors are more likely to have the following neurodevelopmental disabilities, and risk increases with decreasing gestational age. They have impaired cognitive skills, motor deficits, um, including fine or gross motor delay and cerebral palsy, sensory impairments, including vision and hearing losses, and behavior and psychological problems. Um, one of the things that happens, uh, we saw before, um, interventricular hemorrhages that these very young babies get is that they get hydrocephalus following the hemorrhages. It happens in up to 35% of, of infants who have IVH. It um, in increases with the severity of the IVH. It can be obstructive, communicating both transient, sustained, slow or rapidly uh, progressive, may need a shunt placed, and these are patients, and the patients who do get a shunt need to be monitored for shunt malfunction or infection. So here's a normal brain is uh, on the left, a uh, brain with very enlarged ventricles, and that's one of the reasons that we measure head circumferences um, so regularly in babies, is because their fontanelle is open, if the, there's something wrong with the brain, the head will enlarge, as opposed to adults whose um, sutures are closed. So there's hydrocephalus on the left so with a normal brain in comparison. You can see the ventricles are widely enlarged. They're not supposed to be that large. Chronic health issues include um, frequent hospitalizations um, in, in children, and mostly due to respiratory infections, um, including asthma. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus uh, in the first two or three years of life can be a real problem. Uh, feeding problems as well as uh, um, a number of surgical issues. Um, chronic medical problems include something called bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which we now call chronic pulmonary disease, um, which results uh, from being ventilated and high oxygen use in um, the neonatal period. Uh, a lot of these patients have reflux. They're at increased risk for crib death or sudden infant death syndrome. They have vision and hearing impairments, also retinopathy of prematurity and high use of oxygen, and generally uh, grow poorly, although eventually may catch up. Um, BPD um, is um, defined as patients who require oxygen at 36 weeks uh, post-conceptual age. Um, and there's persistent abnormalities on chest x-ray. Uh, there may be abnormal lung function during the first year of life. That requires monitoring supportive care, oxygen at home, sometimes medications. We use diuretics and bronchodilators. And these babies have increased caloric needs. So you can see um, uh, that after all of this um, ventilatory support as a, a small infant, you can get a lot of fibrosis of the lung. On CAT scan, you can see the areas of, of fibrosis. And really, the alveoli just don't develop. They're damaged. And they have to grow back. Um, and so um, this is the uh, infant equivalent of COPD. Um, these patients get exacerbations, just like COPD patients. Um, they can have cardiac problems from core pulmonal and, and pulmonary hypertension and ultimately growth failure. And we treat these exacerbations aggressively. Reflux um, is common in pre premature infants, patients with BPD or neurological, congenital defects. Complications include poor weight gains, apneas, bradycardias, aspiration and choking, esophagitis and laryngospasm, and just general discomfort. The retinopathy of prematurity is a proliferative retinal disorder, um, really caused by high concentration of oxygen. Um, it can eventually improve. Um, these babies also get amblyopia, that is a, um, a weakness of the eye muscles and strabismus, significant nearsightedness, uh, anisometropia is a very big difference in the visual acuity of each eye. Um, surgical, a lot of these babies are susceptible to something called necrotizing enterocolitis uh, and intestinal perforation. And, um, it's really caused by insufficient blood flow to the bowel, gastrostomy tube platements, fundoplications, uh, BP shunts if they have hydrocephalus, they may require tracheotomies, 
um, may have cardiac defects that require repair in the neonatal period, and both the umbilical and inguinal hernias are common. So here's a picture of necrotizing anacolitis, and you actually see a gas in the bowel wall from this. It's caused by um, organisms and insufficient blood flow. And that's called pneumatosis intestinalis. And you can actually see it. It may not be that obvious on this x-ray, but when you see it up front, you can actually see little gas bubbles in the air, in the wall of the bowel. Um, it's probably most, I'm going to stop after this. Um, they've looked at the effect of prematurity on the health of adults. What happens to you when you're an adult if you were preemie? And they've identified three areas uh, that it really impacts upon. And one is insulin resistance, and that preterm adults appear to be more likely to have insulin resistance and higher blood pressures compared to adults born at full term. That's a fairly recent article. Um, another one is hypertension and vascular changes, and that is adults born, to, born premature may have higher blood pressures compared to those born full term. And that was in two separate articles they looked at that. And finally, reproduction. Premature has been associated with a de decreased reproductive capacity in adulthood. So I thought that's really interesting. And I'm sure it's just the start of it. Um, I'll save inborn errors of metabolism for another time <laughs> because there's lots of them. <laughs> and uh, it's, they're really, it's one of the, these are these rare disorders that you, um, and, and can't, if you lump them all together, it actually um, accounts for a fair number of disease, but each one of them by itself. These are things like um, Lorenzo's oil and adrenal liquid dystrophy and uh, ornithine transcormamylase and just all these uh, enzyme deficiencies, really. And it's interesting, um, interesting cases. But I'll do that some other time because it's 9 o'clock already. Thank you. All right, thanks.